What I'd like to share with you is talking about the circular economy, but what it really is about is the need for system change to come up with some very inspiring new ideas and solutions for the many, many problems we're facing on this planet, in businesses, but also in our personal lives. And I think Dietrich was already mentioning a couple of them. So it's something which goes much deeper. Uh, but to get to system change, that starts from here, from within. It's something where we all have to feel the necessity as we are here as a group, members of this wonderful company, how can we from within here really feel that need for change? And that's something I'd like to share with you. And that's why they've also asked me to not only talk about the topic of circle economy, but to share with you also my personal transformation. Because I'm a typical example of somebody coming from the old linear world. And if you want to look at my career path, I started uh, studying in Rotterdam, where also DJ and Sander were both studying. And of course, there I had to become the president of our student fraternity. Then I went into the corporate world, uh, where I became, um, I worked for the company Bulls. For you who know about drinks and wines, Bulls is a very well-known brand. I made my corporate career here. We're going to go ahead? Gonna let's, go ahead. let's see what, I, yes, there we are. You see, that's, that's the kind of symbolism which expresses the world of macho ego and power. Again, coming from that, going into the corporate world, becoming, at a very young age, member of the executive board of Bulls Vesan, and at that time a merged conglomerate. Then I was able to do a management buyout, so we bought Bulls out of this merged conglomerate, and I led that buyout as the CEO, and put in all the money I could find to become a shareholder in that company. And then later on, we merged that into Rémy Cointreau, a French group in Paris, and I became CEO of that company in Paris, so I was really going on this corporate ladder and it was all fantastic, at least that's what I thought at that time. And then I joined the world of private equity, the world of even bigger money, big deals, etc., etc. At a certain point in my life, that was when I was 45, that's still quite some time ago, um, and I, then I took a sabbatical, that was just after we did the deal with Rémy Cointreau, and I took a sabbatical and I asked myself the key question, what really makes me tick? What is this person really all about? And not about all this, this corporate stuff and money and power, but what am I really all about? And I got a very clear but extremely unexpected answer. And that was nature, nature, nature. But I wasn't doing anything with nature in my daily life because I was so busy with everything in this corporate career, I didn't have time to understand what that meant. So in that sabbatical of about six months, I really took the time to try to get an answer to that. That started with reading books, meeting some incredible people, completely different from the world that I was used to, and that brought me to Africa. Um, at the moment, I'm spending about 40%, 30 to 40% of my time in Africa doing all kinds of different things, but there I met people who were busy spending their whole lives, dedicating their whole lives to uh, defend nature, were conserving nature, very intelligent people, highly educated people, coming from a completely different world than the world I was coming from, and I thought my world was everything and everything which really mattered. So that really started to open up my eyes and say, okay, what does that mean for me? How is that going to change my life? So in the meantime, now spending that time in Africa as one thing, chairman of African Parks, wonderful organization, we're managing uh, seven national parks all over Africa, defending, funnily enough, nature and the animals from us, from the homo sapiens, from the human beings, because we're the biggest threat to nature, strangely enough, but also setting up a private equity firm in Kenya, Nairobi, to help young entrepreneurs, providing them with equity, but also providing them with some coaching. How can we help these young businessmen to run their businesses? But the third thing I set up that's more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago, something called the Foundation for Natural Leadership. And what is that all about? That's an organization which organizes trails for corporate executives, politicians, people who are in business, and we bring them to Africa for a very intensive week where we share with them the feeling what it means to get in touch with nature and actually to make a voyage with your inner self. So bear with me a second and we'll just take a quick little, maybe you just close your eyes and if it's very scary, yeah, close your eyes and try to go with me to Africa just for one minute. And now we're in Africa. You have a week, we're on this trail. Um, and you have night watch. It's the third night of the trail. It's three o'clock in the morning and you have night watch. What does that mean? Because we're in big five territory with very dangerous animals, they're lions, hyenas, everything, snakes, scorpions, you have to protect the camp. And the only thing which protects you at night is a campfire. 
So now you're staring in the campfire, it's three o'clock in the morning, you have to keep the fire going, and with your torch, you have to make rounds around the group, but the others are all sleeping, to defend the camp. And then suddenly you hear there the lion roaring. There you hear an elephant taking down some branches. And there you hear the hyena. And then suddenly, boom, here you get that feeling. Now I understand what it means to be part of this greater system. Now I understand what oneness is all about. I am part of this wonderful system. That is what nature is all about. But now the second question comes soaring in. Who am I and who are we to do with this planet what we're doing? Building new roads, new cities, come on, let's grow. Did we ask that elephant, that bird, that tree? Who are we to determine the way we're running this planet? Nine billion people. Is there still space left for all those animals, for those trees? <laughs> Where are we heading? Are we thinking about these things enough? That's what happens during that trail. So in that week, this big corporate executive who suddenly becomes that small when he's sitting there at three o'clock in the morning, scared shit because he hears all these animals, etc., etc. <laughs> then he really starts understanding what the, world sustain what the word sustainability really means. What kind of responsibility do I have as a CEO or a politician when I go back to my rat race and how can I translate that feeling, which I now feel, which is very clear, I have a very clear feeling that I feel that something has to change in the way we're doing things. How can I translate that into my daily life, the way we run our companies, run our politics, et cetera, et cetera. That is the essence of the system change we need. So I want to share with you, with you that feeling. This is what motivates me and what motivated me to move away from the old linear economy where I came from. I'm extremely thankful and grateful what I've learned there. I've learned a lot, a lot of experience. And I'm now in the phase of my life, that how can I translate that and do things with the knowledge I have, but with this very strong feeling, to see how we can change things in a positive manner. And that doesn't mean we all have to go to Greenpeace, and as we say in Dutch, geitenvolle sokken, and start floating around and, 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 and meditating the whole day. No, we, we can do very serious business with this kind of thinking, but it's something, as Dilek was saying, which brings us uh, also to the, to the fact that we can look into the eyes of the next generations, our children and grandchildren, and say we, we at least try to do something about the problems we were facing. So our system is in crisis. It is a system crisis. It's not only a financial economic crisis. We've read a lot about that in the past years. The big problems we've been facing and we're still facing in the EU and the debt problems and the banks and all the problems we're having there. But it's also an ecological crisis, the way we treat the planet, the way we treat other animals, other creatures on this, on this, uh, on this planet. But it's also a social crisis. The growing gap between the world of the have and the have nots. The 1.3 billion people which per day are still starving of hunger. 1.2 billion people who do not have clean drinking water. Those are problems we're facing, we're not solving them. Then we have nine billion, we're going to nine billion people on this planet. Uh, we have things we have to start thinking about. But it's also an ethical crisis, where corruption used to be something we all laughed because it happened with the mafia in Italy. Nowadays, corruption is very close by. You open the newspapers in The Hague, in the municipality, in our own governments, but in, in governments next by, in companies, people who are greedy, taking away, corrupting each other, it's becoming something which apparently seems to be normal. That doesn't feel good and we're not on the right track with that. The whole short-term shareholder value model where companies are focused, specifically the companies in the stock exchange, to perform only on a quarterly basis, to make these profits every quarter to make more profits losing out of sight what is better for the longer term of the company, which is better for the company, for the people working in the company, and makes us all feel better. And luckily we have here a company where we have visionary shareholders and a board who's willing to take on these problems and see how can we do something which is not only right for today, but much more intelligently which is right for the coming years to come and again for the next generations. The problem with all of that is if you talk about all these negative things, and that's what's happening in the media, unfortunately, and unfortunately also politicians, in my opinion, are using fear much too much as a weapon to approach us. We continue to read about problems in the world. There's wars going on everywhere. There's a crisis going on everywhere. There's corruption going everywhere. And what we really need is to shift away from that feeling of fear and become much more positive and what we need is new inspirational leadership, new ideas, which can bring us to solutions which are much better for the planet, but also for us as well. Uh, and that one of these inspirational things is the, the circle economy. Now, what is the circle economy? 
all about. It is the antidote of the linear economy. And what is the linear economy? The linear economy is if you would be a man from Mars and you'd be looking down on planet Earth and you'd see the human beings, what do you see happening? All these human beings are taking out natural resources every day, new natural resources, more and more and more. And the only thing they're saying to each other is grow, 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 as if that is the only thing we can think about. So what we're doing is, that man from Mars is looking at us, we're taking out every day new natural resources, we're putting them in a linear growth model. With that, we're depleting the natural resources, which per definition are scarce. They're not infinite, they are finite per de definition. We're putting them in this linear growth model, we're creating huge amounts of waste, and we're literally suffocating in our own waste. Look what's happening with plastic, the plastic soup problems on the ocean. Many of you may, may have heard about it. We have at the moment in the Pacific Ocean an island of plastic, which is the size of France, which is floating on the ocean. Just imagine what that does to the fishes, to the whole life in the, in the ocean. To what future are we heading with that kind of a model? But of course, water pollution, toxic pollution, uh, nuclear waste, etc., etc. So we have to do something about that. And the idea with the circular economy is to break away from that linear model and to move into something which is much more intelligent. 99% of all the materials used today on this planet is turned into waste within six months after sale. That is just not an intelligent system. Whatever you think about, uh, about the feeling of nature, et cetera, et cetera, but that is just not an intelligent system. So we have to use our intelligence to find ways that we not continuously take out these raw materials. I'll give you another example. In the, in the Earth at the moment, we still have for 49 years copper left. So we're using copper, and if we go on with the way we're using copper today, we still have 49 years of copper left, and then the copper is finished. There's no copper left. But if you look at the huge piles of waste we have in the world, they're full of copper. So there is more than enough copper in the system without having to take out always new copper. So once we find a system to force people who are producing products which use copper, that's fine. But when you use copper, you as a producer become responsible that when that product comes to the end of its life cycle, you're responsible to find a business system that that copper comes back into the system and it can be reused again. And then we can go on without having to take out new copper. We just use the copper which is already in the system today. And that's an intelligent way of circular uh, thinking which can help us going forward. So the current, what we call linear take, make and waste economy has had its best time, is broken, we have to find something new. On top of that, it's not sustainable. If we look at our planet today, our planet needs one and a half year to generate what we're taking out in one year. So everything we're taking out of the planet today in a year, we need one and a half years the planet needs to regenerate. I.e., today we would need already ideally one and a half planet to do what we're doing at the moment. That is with the current level of consumption. If the Chinese and the Indians start to consume the way the North Americans and the Western Europeans consume, eating the same amount of meat, for example, we need three to four planets already today. So that means if we don't change something to our system, we already today, with that consumption pattern, would need three or four planets, which we don't have. So if we like it or not, we're going to have to find other solutions to this problem. And on top of that, we're not even having fun. Again, all these miseries over the media and all those problems. And an interesting, what I always think is an interesting um, um, symbolism is the king of Bhutan who launched the idea of gross national happiness. We're always talking about gross, nas gross, gross national product, and I'm an economist as well, so you grow your economy, and it's plus 3% GDP or 4% GDP, and this king of Bhutan, which is a very little kingdom up uh, near Tibet, and I had the big honor to visit that country, he launched that concept of gross national happiness, saying that's what I'm, a, as I as a king of my country should worry, not about the growth of the economy, but if my people are happy, and then you come to completely different ways of thinking. And I won't go into that now too long, but I think it's always interesting to keep in mind, what are we here for on Earth? What is our real scope of being human beings on this planet? Is it really only about economic growth? Or are there other things which really make us happy uh, and can be completely different? So let's at least think about these things when we start putting together a new model. 
Our circle economy and the way we think is very much inspired by nature, as I already tried to tell you with my own examples of Africa, because if you look at nature, nature in itself is a perfect circle economy. Everything in nature before we came on this planet was completely circular. The trees fall from the tree, it's, it's fuel for the next cycle. The animal dies, it's fuel for, the, fuel for the next cycle. So everything in nature is in complete harmony. Nothing is wasted. In nature, waste does not exist. It's when we came in with our systems, we did a lot of clever things, not, let's not forget about that. We industrialized the world. That's when we started to go off track with that thinking. And we made the biggest mistake in my belief in human history when we thought in the Industrial Revolution that we could control nature, that we could manipulate nature, which is utter nonsense. We are part of nature, we are nature. And make no mistake, if we continue to go on the way we're doing, nine billion people doing to the, with the planet what we're doing today, nature will always find its natural way of restoring the balance. It will shrug three times, a couple of tsunamis, earthquakes, some uh, epidemics which will be spread and we will automatically be reduced as a species back to maybe, I don't know, two, three billion people. Do we want to let that happen if we know today with the intelligence we have that there are other solutions which can be put together and that's what the idea of the circle economy is all about. So let's start moving now again to, to, to the positive side. We, the, the most of the companies started in the environmental focus, the green movement, that was all about risk and compliance. Then they moved to the sustainability focus, that's where most companies are active today, have to do with cost reduction and eco-efficiency. But what we're now saying, the next way we're going to move is a circular focus, that's much more about innovation and value creation. So how can we be more clever, be more innovative in our business systems to make, make things work in a much more clever way, but at the same time also be making more money? And here the old linear world comes to help us in the form of a study which was done by McKinsey. McKinsey, a very respected but a linear consultant coming from the old linear world, they got the assignment to make this study on what would happen if only in the EU we would transfer from the current linear economy to a, a circular economy. And they come up with a staggering figure that that in, in, in this case could lead to up to $600 billion of savings per year only in the EU. That is the equivalent of 4% of the GDP in the EU. So when we're talking about the big crises we're facing, just by moving to this circular economy, you would be able to make enormous amounts of additional money to what we're doing today. This would reflect probably in the Netherlands, and we're talking to the Dutch government now, we had a meeting with Mark Rutte just before the summer, that that would translate probably roughly to 20 to 30 billion only for the Netherlands. And look at the problems we're facing in the Netherlands, we, we have to save 6 billion, a lot of money. We said, Mark Rutte, look here, we have 20, 30 million. If you're willing with your government and with us all together, to come to a circular system, there are much more clever ways of uh, solving our problems than just cutting costs. But, and that's what a very important part of the thinking, that we cannot, nobody can do that alone. You cannot do that alone as the corporate world, we cannot do that alone uh, from politics or governments, not alone from the academic world. We need to find a way and a platform where we finally come together to achieve system change and therefore a multi-stakeholder uh, platform is needed. A platform where all the relevant stakeholders can come together. So the corporate world, very important, but we need the politi political world and the governments on the table as well. Also the financial world, the banking and the pension funds have to be part of that. But also the academic world, the world of science, they're full of the most wonderful knowledge if it comes to material sciences, but they've told us we don't have the way to untap that knowledge we have to the business world. For some reason, those worlds do not communicate. And that's why we said, well, let's create this platform, which we call the circle economy, which is a platform, a multi-stakeholder platform, where all these players can come together. Everybody can share his knowledge and experience on that platform and see how we then together can transform company by company, organization by organization, from the linear economy to that more circular economy. So that is what that platform is all about. I'll not go into too much detail exactly how, how that all works. Um, but the platform we have created, and that's been now in existence for about one and a half years, is a very much action-oriented platform. 
So this is not a think tank, it's not a debating club, it's an action platform where members uh, become a member, and we're very proud and happy that the Xindao company has recently become also a member of the platform, together with a number, and I'll show you later, of very reputable uh, organizations. And the aim is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And what are the characteristics of the platform? It's a cooperative, so it means it, the, the platform doesn't belong to anybody, but to all the members. So it's not a platform belonging to Mr. or Mrs. or any big company or interest, no. It's a neutral platform which is created to the benefit of everybody who's willing to participate in turning into a circular economy. So it's a cooperative uh, which is a Dutch legal entity. It's non-profit because as soon as the platform would become a profit, people say, oh, well, they're, they're trying to fill their own pockets and finding clever ways of doing business. No, the platform itself is non-profit, but the members of the platform can and should be as profitable as possible because we want them to show the world that by becoming circular, you can become more profitable. And it's open again to individuals, companies and organizations, and very important, it's embracing. So we're, we, we also call that very often a non-ego platform. We want to be embracing, everybody is welcome, everybody who has something to bring to the platform in terms of knowledge uh, or experiences, so companies, but again, also universities, uh, and governments, etc., are all very, very welcome on the platform. The organization form we've chosen, Einstein teaches us, if you want to achieve syst uh, system change, you cannot do that with the same tools and system and organizations which belong to the kind of structure you want to change. So from day one, we said we're not going to have boards and supervisory boards and all those kind of hierarchical systems. We started also here with a circle. The first is a circle of consciousness. People from very different background, different age and genders. As an example, 70 plus Herman Weifels, a very well-known person in the Netherlands, who's very much into sustainability, but also ladies of 20 who started the first electrical car rally in the Netherlands, and everything in between, clever consultants, spiritual ladies from Sweden, um, but also an internet entrepreneur in his 30s, who the first time I was talking to him about changing the world with this kind of thinking said, well, with your thinking, you can forget it because here you need internet, social uh, media, we need Facebook, we need Twitter, the whole work. So I got a, a crash course two years ago about how to use social media, which I believe, and we haven't touched on that a lot, but probably the biggest change agent today to make this kind of thing happen is internet. Internet is our savior. Internet is the biggest blessing I believe we've, we've received as humans on this earth and that is going to trigger the change because the change is not coming from top down from the big companies and from the big political parties. The change is coming bottom up, young generations, people who here feel we want to change and we're looking for ways to change. And that is a great thing to work together with. That's why there are a lot of young people involved on the platform. Then the people who do the day-to-day -day work, the circle of action, the core team, uh, here you see a number of them. Again, you see relatively young people. I am by far the eldest in this whole, um, I think the average age is, is early 30s if. Um, very clever, intelligent people who all are willing to change the world and bring their talents to the table. And this group, for example, is now working also together with the Xindao team to see how we can translate that also into uh, Xindao and their way of working. Here you see again a number of the partners and service members. You see some huge companies like uh, Philips and AXO and DSM, but also wonderful companies like Xindao, Deso. So it's a mix of very different companies, but also as you see, there, there are um, uh, universities involved, University of Wageningen, Delft, uh, and very recently as said, very important also the financial world, who initially were very skeptic. They said, what is I as a bank what have I got to do with a circular economy? How can I as a bank do something? But luckily we found the, the Rabobank, the Rabobank, our biggest uh, uh, national bank, um, and also now PGGM, that's our, one of our biggest pension funds in the Netherlands with huge amounts of money, who now understand the importance of participating in this platform to see how they can help to make this work. And most recently, as I mentioned, the Dutch government, where we had a meeting with our prime minister and also with the Minister of Economic Affairs and INM, and now the government is coming to the table and saying, okay, we're really going to help because we understand that if we can come up with the right kind of legislation, the kind of fiscal policies to help this shift and change happen, 
and we all do that together and we share that on a platform, we really think that it has a chance of succeeding. Um, I, I won't go too much into detail on these slides. This is how, what we're really doing on the platform. Here you see a number of our principles. There's no such thing as waste. Use the power of the sun instead of all these fossil fuels. Stimulate diversity. Good, good rather than less bad. And true costing. Don't fool yourselves when you make products, but really understand what true costing is about. The, the oil companies, they still pretend that the oil coming out of the ground is for free. That's of course nonsense. That belongs in a way to us all and look at the pollution that's happening. So you have to think about true costing. And the key drivers, again, the growing population, increasing wealth, unsustainable use of resources, the take-make waste production system and transforming consumer preferences. All things which are happening on the platform. I'm gonna skip also these wonderful things. Uh, maybe coming to a few examples. Um, when we started with this whole thinking and we said, okay, how are we going to help these companies? We noticed very early on that it was very interesting to um, um, work also with total value chains. So not only looking at a company, but now look at, at value chains, the textile value chains, the water uh, value chain, uh, or the plastic value chain. And then suddenly what happens is people come and sit around the table who have never sat around the table before. And that creates a completely new way of thinking. Just take this example of the textiles. So suddenly we got a group of people, again, this multi-stakeholder model. So you get people producing textiles, but you get also the DSMs of this world who are chemical companies who are suppliers to the textile world. But you also get the Leger des Heils, the Salvation Army, who are the ones collecting old clothing in the streets. Uh, so they're sitting around the table. And then you get Vergansewinkel, uh, who is uh, d doing the waste recineration, but you also get uh, a fashion designer. He's never sat around the table with the Leger des Heils and with DSM and with Vergansewinkel. But now suddenly, because they're all around the table, I'm thinking, okay, how could we make this textile group, how can we make that circular? Then an idea evolves, and literally that happened. This company called Mud Jeans, which is a startup company in the Netherlands, who said, we're not gonna sell jeans anymore, we're going to lease jeans. Now what happens is instead of buying jeans, you lease jeans for five euro a month. And after a year when you're fed up with your jeans or there's something happening with jeans, you, you bring them back to mud jeans. So now we've resolved the whole problem of recycling. The jeans already were made in the beginning that they, they, they take into account that they will probably be coming back in the first one or two years. And they're made of material which very easily can be recycled. So instead of taking out new cotton out of the nature and the system and a lot of water which goes with making that, which is extremely pollutive, now suddenly we're, we're making huge efficiencies because we're using those same genes again to make new genes. Or if there are only maybe two big cuts in it, you just wash them and you sell them as a vintage genes because nowadays genes with a few cuts even sell for a much higher prices. That's marketing. So you can become very creative in the way you do things. And that is actually what's, requ what's required. So it's, 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 it's also, it's an Another way of thinking is opening up your, your views to the world and trying to be much more creative how we can do things more intelligently. I'll give you another example, the coffee industry. Very boring traditional industry. Making coffee for years, x billion all over the world. Now you put your circular eyeglasses on, you look at that industry, what happens, what you see? Okay, less than that percent, less than a percent of the coffee plants when you grow it goes into your cup of coffee. The rest is all waste. If you're able to collect the coffee drop, the, the coffee, um, whatever, the coffee drop, you all understand that? <laughs> if you're able to collect that, that is the most fertile ground to grow mushrooms. So now suddenly, instead of the x billion coffee industry, you're suddenly creating a new industry making mushrooms because you're using that. The waste coming out of that is wonderful for a pig uh, feed. So you're using that to make that. All the waste which is then still left, all the organic waste, you use to make biomass, you make energy. So now suddenly that boring coffee industry, x billion a year, suddenly creates all kinds of new industries, new employment, new ways of making money where you do not have to waste everything on the world. So it's all just opening up your eyes, looking at things differently and trying to make things more circular. This is another example. Uh, moving to more performance-based consumption. I'll give you one example of Philips, light bulbs, a project we're working on, knowing the, the CEO of Philips very well. He admitted 
that in the short-term shareholder, val um, sh short shareholder value model of Philips, he was very much uh, pressed to continue to go on with the old bulb, eh, the oude gloeilamp, which Philips is well known for. Because in the short-term shareholder value model, that is a wonderful product. Because not only do, the, the biggest thing is every two months it breaks down, you have to go and buy new lamps, new bulbs, which in the short-term shareholder model is beautiful because every time the consumer has to buy new bulbs. When we change the business system and agree with Philips that they're going to participate in that, and we're not going to buy bulbs as a business system, but we're going to buy the service of light. So for an example, Philips make a contract with Schiphol Airport and says, we, Philips will provide you with all the lighting you need. So we make a contract for X lumen light per year on the landing uh, um, uh, strips and on the, and the, the, the shops and on the departure halls and everything. And I mean, the, the amount of light you use at Schiphol is unbelievable. Now we'll transform that, we're going to pay you for lumen light. Now suddenly, Philips takes out their latest technology, the latest technology LED lighting, which they put on the market, which can save up to 20 times the electricity of the old bulb, 20 times less electricity. But even more importantly, you don't have to replace them every two months. The current bulbs can go on for 10 years, and the newest technology coming up now will even last 20 years. So instead of having somebody in the halls of Schiphol replacing those land bulbs every two months, suddenly you, you can leave them for there for 10 and 20 years. Now then together, we're making a system change. Then together, as an, org as, as an economy, we're making huge leaps forward. And that's the kind of thinking we need. But again, you need the companies to cooperate. You need the governments to facilitate that with legislation, with their tax systems. You need the knowledge coming from the universities to provide where possible technologi technological innovation to make all these things happen. I'm going to start finish. This, this is just to show you uh, very proudly. This is the Xindao um, map. And we're not going to go into that in detail. But these gentlemen in the front row, they're all busy with this. And it's just showing you for Xindao what we call a circle scan. So what we do when a company becomes a member, we make a circle scan. And we say, what is the potential, for example, of Xindao? How can we make that circular? And again, I'm not going to go into details. But here you see all the raw materials they're using and what kind of quantities go into the products. This is the transformation, the, the transportation, uh, which is used to, to oh, this is the transportation. This is the paper we use to make all the catalogs, which is immense, just the, the, the amount of paper and the kind of pollution. So what happens if you could do that electronically? So that's all put in, that's all mapped out. And then you start, you start calculating what is the impact of all that and how can you change things. And that then leads to this kind of a chart, which again will be explained in one of your next sessions for sure, where you start defining what are the projects you could identify as Xindao. This is specifically for Xindao, where you could become circular. And this is where you have a high impact. The bigger the, the bubble is, the biggest impact for Xindao. This is the high syst systemic impact. And this is the low involvement of the organization and high involvement of the organization. So this is, of course, where it's all very interesting from here. This is a very low brainer because you need very low involvement. Uh, and that is 15 as an example. The XD, uh, the XD retail web shop and online take back. That has a good impact. But all these things are very interesting. So let's hope together we can really make these things happen. So before, oh yes, I asked, of course, what were the four, four most important slides from Xindao. And I got then this slide. And I'm not sure why it's so important. but. Is of course the people involved, but this, of course, is also very important to show you to show you what your managers, <laughs> that your managers are really serious about this stuff. They're really taking their time to understand how can we make Xindao also a circular company. And I'm again very proud to be on the board, and I'm very proud that these things are happening. And I'd love now to stop talking and let's see how we can make uh, Xindao circular. Thank you very much.